Okay, well, uh, thanks very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present. Um, so please, any clarifying questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, so I'm, it's, a, it's a little bit of a weird seminar, so I'm gonna be trying to present two papers at once. And the reason for this is that, so, so what we're gonna be doing is um, uh, we're gonna try and develop a method for um, measuring the firm level exposure to specific shocks. And at the time when we first wrote this paper, uh, the best example we could come up with was Brexit. But since then, a lot has happened. Uh, so we wrote another paper about the firm level exposure to epi epidemic diseases. So now I'm going to try and present both at the same time. It's the same methodology applied to two different economic questions. This is joint work with Stefan, Lawrence, and Ahmed. Effective policymaking often requires understanding the economic impact of specific events, policy measures, and other shocks. I guess a great example of this is we need to understand what are the firm level impacts of the coronavirus if we want to know how can we help firms get through this uh, period. However, quantifying the granular impacts of such shocks is often difficult. So for example, the Dutch government might want to know if Dutch food exporters are ready for Brexit or not. Or you know, the German government might wonder whether the Fukushima earthquake is affecting German car manufacturers. Finally, you know, which firms uh, expect financing problems in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, so those are all important specific questions about the firm level impact of specific shocks. And what we're going to try and do is uh, to propose a general methodology for isolating such firm level exposures to the costs, benefits, and risks uh, relating to specific events. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to analyze what executives and investors talk about in their quarterly conference calls. So I'll be very specific about this, but this is basically a methodology that measures the impact of specific shocks by looking at what people say about these impacts. Uh, and uh, so as you've already seen, I'm going to illustrate this method with a comprehensive analysis of the firm level impacts of COVID-19 and of how US UK and uh, other international firms respond to the consequences of the 26, 2016 Brexit referendum. Um, I want you to think of this as essentially a way of conducting a survey without having to actually do the survey and without having set up costs. So it's kind of like a real time survey simply by analyzing what people say about the stuff that's affecting their firms. And the hope, so the hope is that executives are going to talk about things that are important uh, to their firms, and I'll, I'll show you exactly how that works. Um, so in this sense, we relate to a, a kind of a new literature that tries to um, measure the, the firm level impact of uh, specific shocks using survey methods. Uh, this has been developed in particular in the context of the Brexit debate, uh, which has been focused very much about the effect of Brexit uncertainty on firms. Um, uh, kind of material, so, so it, in substance, we're also going to relate to another literature that's been kind of thinking about how does uncertainty in one part of the world spill over to other parts of the world, in particular in Brexit. This is kind of a nice example of a shock that's originating in the UK, and we're going to see how this shock to uncertainty that originates in one country propagates to other countries. And then finally, there's, of course, a, 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 an explosively large literature on COVID-19. And essentially what we do there, I'm not going to uh, uh, kind of do anything too magical here. I'm just going to, you know, basically show you how to generate some data that we can use to try and analyze firm level impacts in real time. OK, so let me, but let me start with Brexit. So, so the question here is, what is the global impact uh, uh, of Brexit uncertainty? Let me kind of first kind of summarize up front what we find. So the first main finding in this first paper is that there's widespread concern about Brexit related risks among international firms outside of the UK. In particular, Irish firms are on average even more worried about Brexit related uncertainty than UK firms, but there's impacts as far as a field as the United States, South Africa, and Singapore. The second main finding is that UK and non-UK firms overwhelmingly expect negative impacts from such things as regulatory divergence in the wake of Brexit, 
reduce labor mobility, reduce trade access, and all the things essentially that economists have been talking about. On the flip side, there's no evidence of economic benefits touted by the Leave campaign. In particular, we don't really see executives anywhere in the world, not even in the UK, talking about uh, the coming great deregulation and how good that might be for their business in the UK. Um, we find that uh, risks associated with Brexit are strongly associated with significant reductions in investment and employment growth among exposed firms between 2015 and 2018. Um, uh, so this is the effect of Brexit risk. I'm also going to talk about the direct impact of news about Brexit. Uh, but these first moment shocks uh, 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 seem to be priced in, in asset markets, but have not yet realized in firm behavior as far as we can measure. Um, so far, at least. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm first going to lay down our methodology that's going to be the same between the two papers, essentially. Uh, then we're going to validate our measures in various ways. And then I'm going to talk about what do we think are the firm level impacts of this specific event, uh, namely Brexit. Is there a question? Okay. So let me first tell you like uh, the, the data source for all of what we're doing here. So we have a complete set of something like 150,000 English language earnings. Uh, somebody needs to mute. Okay. Um, uh, these earnings conference calls, if you're not familiar with this, this is the thing that Elon Musk tends to screw up. Uh, so, so if you have a firm that's listed pretty much anywhere in the world, you have an obligation to tell your investors what's going on in the firm. And one way that firms comply with that requirement is that they uh, hold conference calls where the executive team jumps on the phone with the firm's analysts and other interested members of the public. The executive team gives a, a presentation uh, and that's followed by a Q&A session. And what we have are the transcripts of these conversations for uh, over 7,000 firms for 71 countries. Actually, uh, uh, for the more recent pe period, it's more like 80 countries. Um, and uh, okay, so we have these texts of what the firm's executives and investors talk about. And the research question here is what share of the conversation between the management and participants centers on costs, benefits, and risks associated with this specific event, in this case, Brexit? So just so you get an idea, um, the, so, so we have transcripts for about 400 uh, firms that are headquartered in the UK, just shy of a thousand uh, uh, firms headquartered in uh, the EU outside of the UK. Uh, we have a, a, about 3,700 uh, in the US and another two and a half thousand in the rest of the world. So there's coverage of, you know, all the relevant places here, although you should keep in mind that most of our data is always for the US, about half of our data set essentially are US firms, uh, but we're gonna make appropriate adjustments for that. Um, as a case in point, um, how, uh, so why might international firms care about Brexit? Well, a lot of them do business in the UK in a way, simple way of measuring that is the number of these firms here in the first columns that have a subsidiary in the UK, and you see it's a substantial number. Yeah. So, so we might expect these firms to talk about Brexit and how it affects their business. So here's the, the methodology, it's very simple. We're gonna go through the text of each conference call. I'm gonna show you some examples later. And then we're just gonna count how, number, how often do participants say the word Brexit? And Brexit here is like, a, 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 like, a, like an obvious application because it's very hard to talk about Brexit without saying Brexit. And Brexit has only this one meaning. Yeah? So there's not much ambiguity. So we don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about what words are we going to be looking for. In the case of Brexit, it's very obvious. So um, you know, I'm, I can talk a little bit about how you do this in, in other applications where that uh, might not be so obvious. Uh, but here for Brexit, we're going to construct this variable for each firm in each quarter. So Brexit exposure of firm I in quarter T is just going to be the total number of times they say Brexit divided by the total number of words in the conference call transcript in that quarter. So that's what I'm going to call Brexit exposure. 
I'm going to have uh, another uh, measure that I'm going to call Brexit risk. The idea here is to distinguish when you're talking about Brexit. Are you talking about Brexit because it is, you know, a source of risk for your firm? I want to think about that as like the second moment, the variance uh, of your firm's prospects. Uh, and we might want to distinguish that from first moment impacts, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So how am I going to measure uh, exposure to Brexit risk? Well, I'm going to do the same thing that I did before. I'm going to count how often you say Brexit, but I'm going to count it only. I'm going to count only the number of mentions of Brexit that are done in conjunction or that appear in the conference call transcript in conjunction with a synonym for risk or uncertainty. What this here is, is a dummy variable that's one if the word that we're looking at, uh, so if this Brexit, mention of Brexit here uh, is uh, um, within 10 words of a synonym for risk or uncertainty. Yeah, so if you say risk or uncertainty, I'm gonna look 10 words before and after. Do you say Brexit? If so, I count one. Uh, if not, I don't count it. So this is like a conditional word count. How often are the words Brexit and uncertainty used together? So I'm gonna use that to then construct the Brexit risk for firm I and quarter T. We want to distinguish the second moment impact from the first moment impact. Yeah, so the first moment or the first moment exposure. First moment exposure are things like, you know, uh, uh, Brexit is just going to be bad for our business. That's like a negative. So you're just the mean of the prospects of your firm is lower. So that would be a first moment impact. So how do we measure that? Well, we again go to our mentions of Brexit, but now we're going to look within 10 words before and after each mention of Brexit, and we're going to count the number of positive and negative words. So there's an established literature in computational linguistics that classifies tone words into being positive or negative. So if you say great, fantastic, super, those are positive tone words. If I found, find these positive tone words used in conjunction with the word Brexit, I'm going to count plus one each time. If I find negative tone words, so negative tone words are things like depressing, terrible, bad. If I found, find negative tone words within 10 words of this uh, mention of the word Brexit, I'm going to deduct minus one. Yeah, so this is here uh, uh, kind of a measure of the average sentiment of the words used in conjunction with the word Brexit. And the idea here is if you're saying Brexit is bad for our business, we're going to come up with a negative number here. We're going to construct Brexit sentiment for firm I and quarter T for each of our observations. Okay, so let me kind of pause here. Is this, is this clear so far? If there's any questions? So this is important because this is kind of the basis for the whole paper. So please don't hesitate to ask. I'm, I'm used to like you know, seeing people either nodding or shaking their heads and I'm kind of just looking at my computer screen here. So let me know if anything's unclear. All right, so. In front, I did. Um, is there a question? Uh, Jaydeep, could you type your question into your Q&A and Tarek, could you go on for now? Yeah, okay. So, all right, so. Um, we're constructing Brexit exposure, Brexit risk, and Brexit sentiment for each of our firm quarters. Now, one important concern uh, that we're going to have once we start running regressions is, uh, you know, could, you know, risks associated with Brexit be correlated with other risks? You know, so that's important for interpreting coefficients that we're going to get later. So what's going to be useful for me is to also count the number of times you say uh, you use synonyms for risk or uncertainty when you're not talking about Brexit. So we're going to construct a variable called non-Brexit risk, which simply counts how often do you use synonyms for risk or uncertainty in the transcripts minus the occurrences of Brexit risk. So I'm distinguishing here risks associated with Brexit from risks associated with other stuff. And I'm going to econometrically try and disentangle the two later. Then we're going to do the same thing for sentiment, non-Brexit sentiment of firm I and quarter T is the sentiment that you have about everything else. How are you feeling about business in general uh, as opposed to how are you feeling about Brexit? Okay, 
So now we have sort of a methodology laid out. We have our data set, which is the, the text. Now I'm going to press enter and my Python script is going to generate Brexit exposure, Brexit risk, and Brexit sentiment for each firm quarter. Now we have all these numbers. So the next step is going to be uh, to validate them. So let's look at these numbers and see if they make any sense to us. The first thing that you might want to look at is you might want to uh, uh, check that the firms that are exposed to Brexit according to our measure also have operations in the UK. And you see here that systematically firms that have operations in the UK, either their headquarters or a subsidiary in the UK, have higher Brexit exposure on average. Uh, similarly, if you have a headquarter in the EU, you're more exposed to Brexit than if you don't have uh, a headquarter anywhere in Europe or in the UK. Uh, and then finally, if you sell more in the UK, which is a kind of a measure of all of these things, um, we also find higher Brexit exposure. So this is just a smell test to see that this makes sense. So now let's look at the time series. I'm going to normalize Brexit risk so that the average bridge Brexit risk of a firm that is headquartered in the UK is one. Okay. So the average Brexit risk after 2016, but, uh, between 2016 and 2020 of UK based firms is going to be one. So now let's look at this here. So you see here after the Brexit, so Brexit is not really a topic in conference calls until after the Brexit referendum. This, these are all firms in the world. And you see here that uh, all firms in the world, among all the firms in the world, there's sort of like concern about Brexit here. They talk about Brexit risk. And uh, then there's sort of a bit of a lull, and then there's a spike in 2019 around when kind of important decisions are made, and this spike has not come down since. Now, look at these numbers here that this maxes out at 0.8 because these are international firms. Now, let's compare this to UK firms. So, you see here the scale for UK firms is very different. There's again a spike after the Brexit referendum. But you see that concern with Brexit risk among UK firms kind of goes through the roof in 2019 and actually then stays high. And this is kind of around where all of these hard Brexit decisions are being made. So this makes some sense. Now let me look at average Brexit risk by country. So I'm going to assign each firm to the country in which its operational headquarters is located. And I'm going to look at the average Brexit risk of firms in that country. And the first thing that you see is that the average Brexit risk of Irish firms is actually much higher. Yeah, this is this year 1.6, whereas the UK firms, I've normalized this to one. And this difference here is statistically significant. Irish firms appear to be significantly more worried about risks associated with Brexit than UK firms. And if you, uh, you know, if you remember your kind of uh, uh, graduate trade courses about market access, that makes some sense. Right? So if, you, if Ireland kind of is isolated from the UK, it kind of gets isolated, has, has lower market access as a smaller economy, so it might matter more. Then you can sort of see here, if you go down the list, the economic geography of this, Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, yeah, everybody who's close by. But then you also have sprinkled in countries that have a strong historical tie to the UK, like South Africa, the UK Channel Islands, uh, uh, and so on, Singapore and Australia. So these countries have disproportionately high Brexit risk. Now, where is the UK? US? The US here has an average Brexit risk of 0.13. So which means that the, the average Brexit risk of a firm headquartered in the UK, UK is in the US is 13% of the Brexit risk of the average firm in the UK. And that is comparable about like similar to Italy and Greece. So the US in that sense has disproportionately high Brexit risk. Again, you might speculate because of these historical ties between the US and the UK, many US firms access the European market through the UK. Okay, so let me maybe skip this. You can look at the stuff by sector. Let me just kind of give you an example of what we're measuring here. Yeah, so if you, you can, I, I, so, so remember I count one whenever I find Brexit used in conjunction with the word risk or uncertainty. So one example of this here is like North Star Realty Group. This is a US firm. They talk about this gives rise to greater uncertainty. This uncertainty has been exasperated by Brexit and the prospect of Brexit has resulted in and so forth. Ryanair, yeah, another firm, an Irish firm with high exposure to Brexit. Uh, they talk about uh, how they are affected by 
post-Brexit uncertainty, um, and so on. So here's some few more examples in the paper, just so you see kind of what, what is it that we're measuring in, in the text. Um, remember, we kind of constructed not just Brexit risk, but also Brexit sentiment. The main thing I can tell you about Brexit sentiment is it's overwhelmingly negative. Yeah? Average Brexit sentiment for firms in all countries in the world, yeah, including Ireland, the UK, Germany, Austria, Norway, and the US is negative. There really aren't any countries that have a significantly positive average exposure uh, uh, to Brexit sentiment or significantly positive average Brexit sentiment, except for one very interesting exception, which is the UK Channel Islands. The UK Channel Islands here, they're kind of off the scale here, at plus 0.64. And remember, this is kind of an offshore tax haven for pre predominantly sort of like British uh, individuals. So, so, so I thought this was kind of interesting. Yeah. So that the only kind of uh, firms that robustly and on average positively talk about Brexit are the ones that are in the Channel Islands, nowhere else in the world, including South Africa and so forth. So then we wanted to dig it a little bit deeper. So you can think of this as a, like in a very targeted way of reading these uh, uh, conference call transcripts. So we went and we looked at all the times that we had positive mentions of Brexit. And we wanted to tell you what are these positive mentions of Brexit about. So uh, when firms say positive things about Brexit, and this is true both for UK headquartered and non-UK headquartered firms, about 80% of these positive mentions are mentions like, oh, we're so glad that we're not exposed to Brexit, but maybe our competitors are. Yeah, so they're not really happy about Brexit. They're just happy it's not affecting them in, in, in the direct way. The second most popular positive mention is about the weak pound. Uh, so we have devaluation. I'm going to show you some examples of that. And then only after that uh, come things like better trade access, opportunities from relocation. Uh, uh, what's kind of interesting uh, two major themes in the Leave campaign for UK firms was that there would be more money available to spend domestically. We haven't found a single mention of, of that. And that there would be less regulation domestically. Again, no mentions of that. Okay. Uh, so let me give you an example here. When they say that they're not exposed, despite what's going on with Brexit, uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of softening in our business. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing that we find here. Now let's look at the negative mentions of Brexit. I'm going to read all the times that I find negative mentions of Brexit and categorize them. And what you find, remember, like one of the most important positive categories was the weak pound. But you know, if this is an international finance seminar, we know that you know if you have a devaluation, some people gain and others lose. So the most popular negative thing also is the weak pound. And then after that come the substantive concerns that economists have raised uh, 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 over the last couple of years, worse trade access, labor market frictions, falling consumer confidence, adjustment and transition costs, and new and multiple regulatory re regimes, exactly what you might expect. All right, so, uh, okay, so we've done some smell tests on the text. This kind of all makes a little bit of sense. Um, I want to now do kind of a, use some tricks from asset pricing and look at an event study. And what we're going to do in this event study is we're going to take the stock return, the firm stock returns around the Brexit referendum. So we're going to have a narrow window of day, of trading days around the Brexit referendum and then regress this on conventional controls like the firm's cap and beta and so forth and our measures of Brexit risk and Brexit sentiment. And if what we're doing here makes any sense, what we might expect is a positive sign on Brexit sentiment. The happier you are about Brexit, the higher should be your abnormal stock return around the Brexit referendum. And the more you're exposed to Brexit risk, the lower should be your abnormal stock return around the Brexit referendum. So looking at that regression, this is exactly what you see. Let me kind of, the, the easiest uh, to introduce, these are three days around the publication of the Brexit referendum, you see here that firms that have higher Brexit exposure on average lose market valuation. This here means that the average UK-based firm loses 2.3% of, 
of their market valuation due to its Brexit exposure. Um, uh, and then if you split this up into Brexit risk and Brexit sentiment, you get exactly the predicted signs where firms with higher Brexit risk lose, whereas firms with higher Brexit sentiment gain, which kind of bolsters our interpretation here a little bit. You can do this using the full sample of our measures of Brexit risk or Brexit sentiment or just the, the pre-samples. So basically based only on their conversations that happened before the actual vote. And you can run this only for US firms and you get the same result. All right, um, let me skip the next and just go straight to uh, showing you the firm level effects of Brexit. So I'm hoping, I haven't had a lot of people talk, so, but what I'm hoping is that I've convinced you so far that what we're, what we're measuring here makes some sense. Hi, Tarek. Uh, okay. So we have a few clarification questions so far. Yes, please. Uh, the first one is from J.D. Pobroy. How do you distinguish between a realized risk, which may seem like a sentiment because it occurred in the past and became a first order outcome, versus a forward-looking risk? So um, if you read these transcripts, you're going to see that usually like when they talk about risk, they're talking about that this is sort of a forward-looking. Typically, these are forward-looking. They don't say, we were exposed to this risk then it turned out bad. If they talk about the past, they're just going to say it turned out bad. So, um, th but there is a, a, a deeper problem here, which is, you know, in some sense, I want to see this as a methodology for kind of teasing out first and second moment impacts. But the big problem is that we have nothing to say about the frequency. So, um, but this is kind of, I think we're at the very beginning of measuring this stuff. Even the survey based methods don't really have a good way of doing that. Yeah. So, if you look at like the cutting edge, the edge stuff that, uh, uh, Steve Davis and co-authors are doing, they ask you what is the mean and the variance of your earnings going forward and they look at the distribution, but they don't say over which horizon. Yeah, so, so, so what you're raising here is a fundamental problem that I don't think anybody's really solved uh, in, in, in terms of measuring. Thanks. The second question is from Marco Graziano. Does the methodology account for mentions of sentiment or uncertainty words close to a mention of Brexit in the text, but otherwise unrelated, for example, in a different sentence before a full stop? So you can parse this stuff by sentence or so basically there's two ways of doing this. Like when we first, like when we read our, wrote our first paper on this subject, we kind of decided pretty arbitrarily, we're going to look at text snippets that are 10 words before and after. An alternative way to do it is to parse the text by sentence and just count if you have Brexit and uncertainty in the same sentence. Um, we never found that that made any difference. So we thought it'd be best to just stick to like what we've done in prior work. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure whether I understood exactly your question, but remember also I'm gonna be measuring all the, all the non-Brexit risk and sentiment. So measures of uh, mentions of positive and negative tone words outside of this 10 word interval around the Brexit, uh, the word Brexit. And that's gonna be an important control in what we're doing. I'm gonna show you that next. Thanks. The third question is from Vania Stavrakeva. Did you by any chance do the same for exchange rate risk associated with Brexit event? There's a huge amount of Forex bets by corporates prior to Brexit using derivatives. It's interesting. It doesn't show up in the first moment here. Maybe the dispersion? No, it does. So remember when I talk about, so you're, this is a nice, this is, this is a, a good point. So when, when we look at like the negative and the positive mentions of Brexit, Brexit. Yeah. So remember when I do the Brexit sentiment here, that means I have a, so this is the negative, I have a negative tone word and the word Brexit that, you know, a large chunk of these mentions are talking about the weak pound. Now, some of these mentions are really because of, like the, the, due to real exposure, right? So this is, uh, um, uh, this is like a, a, an airline talking about it. Uh, I had other examples where like, you know, a real estate uh, firm talks about the weak pound and now the weak pound, the pound, pound is weak and uh, foreign buyers are piling, piling into U the UK market. But this probably subsumes particular also financial firms that have these bets. So, so in some sense, so, so, so the answer is yes, we do find that. Um, we haven't kind of branched this out. So by the way, all of our measures are on our website, uh, www.firmlevelrisk.com. We haven't we give you Brexit sentiment overall, but not this split up here, because this split up is done manually, basically. 
All right, other questions? Thanks, that's all. Okay, great. So I hope I answered these questions. Now, let me kind of briefly show you what we do with this. Um, so now you might want to know, uh, or this was before COVID, this was a big topic of discussion. For example, are international firms investing less because of Brexit uncertainty? So if you think back to these discussions, like Emmanuel Macron, for example, was arguing, we need to kick, we need to make a clean cut with UK because Brexit related uncertainty is keeping our firms from investing. So that's an argument that was actually made. Can we find any evidence of that? So the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a firm level outcome. This is measured at annual frequency, uh, like the firm's investment rate. And I'm going to project that on a sector fixed effect, a time fixed effect, and our measures of Brexit risk and sentiment and controls. And these controls are always going to control for the firm's size in various ways, non-Brexit risk and non-Brexit sentiment. So here's just kind of eyeballing the result. I have the firm's investment rate, I over K, and I'm plotting that over a Brexit risk for both UK firms, so those are the red dots, and non-UK firms. And what you see here is a clear negative association. So the higher Brexit risk, both among UK firms and among non-UK firms, the lower is the firm's investment rate going forward. Now, let me show you this in, uh, in the regression context. I over K on the left-hand side, Brexit risk and Brexit sentiment on the right-hand side. Actually, let me go straight to like the, uh, the more stringent um, specification where I also control for non-Brexit risk and non-Brexit sentiment. Okay, so uh, what I want you to note is that the higher Brexit risk, the lower is the firm's investment rate. These are international firms. Um, let me also note that, again, Brexit risk here has a negative sign. There's no loading on Brexit sentiment because, again, we only have outcome variables through the end of the 2018 accounting year. They just came out with the 2019. We haven't updated it yet, but this is, you know, really pre-Brexit. So it makes some sense that what matters before Brexit actually happens, and you might argue it hasn't actually happened yet, but what matters before Brexit actually happens for firms' investment is uncertainty about Brexit. And this is certainly what people have been saying. You have no loading on this positive or negative uh, exposure yet. Yeah, you might get it going forward, but you don't have a loading yet. Now compare this with non-Brexit risk and non-Brexit sentiment. And you see here, non-Brexit risk has a negative loading, non-Brexit sentiment has a positive loading, exactly how you would expect. The happier you are, the more you invest, the sadder you are, less you invest, and the more risk you're faced with, the less you invest. What does this mean? So, um, um, so this means that uh, the average U.S. firm, so now multiply this year with the 0.13 for the U.S. Yeah, so the average U.S. firm invests 0.37% less relative to the mean in the sample. So U.S. firms are not as exposed as Irish firms, where this is about 4%. Uh, reduction in uh, the annual investment rate, so much larger effect for Irish firms than uh, U.S. firms, if you extrapolate from this. Again, you can run this regression for U.S. firms alone, and you get exactly the same result. Okay, so then, you know, you might worry that, you know, executives talk about Brexit risk when they had bad earnings or when they had bad stock returns, but controlling for, like, you know, other, other ways of controlling for non-Brexit sentiment in some sense don't really change the results here. Uh, similarly, we have measures from another paper about trade policy risk that I can control for. Again, not much happens to the coefficient. And then we can do some other kind of stuff that maybe we don't have time to talk about. Here's a placebo experiment. Um, okay. The other thing I wanted to show you is, you know, whatever happens to the investment rate is likely to also happen to employment growth. And this is exactly what you see. Yeah. So what we see here is that um, uh, on the, uh, the, the, av the, the U.S. firm with the average Brexit exposure of a U.S. firm hires 1.21% uh, uh, less relative to the mean uh, in those post-Brexit years than um, uh, uh, than than um, Sorry. Yeah. So then firms that are not exposed to Brexit. Yeah. So, so, so even for the U.S., we get a large, uh, a relatively large uh, uh, estimated effect here on Brexit risk. Again, I want to be a little careful with a 
causal interpretation here. We don't have a natural experiment, but you know, given that I'm controlling for in these specifications for non-Brexit risk and non-Brexit sentiment, uh, as well as for a bunch of other stuff, so this this seems like a fairly reliable uh, uh, estimate. Okay, so let me briefly summarize before I get to the next paper. So we developed a general text-based method for isolating firm level exposures to costs, benefits, and risks relating to specific events. Substantively, what did we learn about Brexit? There's widespread widespread concern about Brexit-related risks among non-UK firms. Yeah, so this was a big question in policy circles, and we have a resounding answer here, yes. So international firms, as far afield as the US and Singapore, are worried about Brexit. Uh, and we find a statistical association between that worry about Brexit and lower investment. UK and non-UK firms overwhelmingly expect negative impacts from regulatory divergence, reduced labor mobility, reduced trade access, etc. There's no evidence of economic benefits touted by the Leave the campaign, particularly uh, the, the, the very little talk or no talk essentially about deregulation and higher UK government expenditures. Um, third, Brexit risk significantly reduces investment and employment both among UK and non-UK firms. Uh, and interestingly, all of this stuff comes from the Brexit risk and not the Brexit sentiment. Remember the Brexit sentiment was priced in asset markets or it looks like it was priced, but we don't see the Brexit sentiment correlating with firm actual outcomes yet, like employment growth or investment. Uh, uh, that correlation is only with Brexit risk. Um, what that's telling me, if you want to interpret now what, what that means, is that probably after Brexit happens, that loading is going to go to the Brexit sentiment. Yeah, then the shock's actually going to be a lot. Okay, any questions? Yes, one from Omar Barbero. How do your estimated coefficient on return or investments compare when one uses alternative measures of exposures, such as sales to UK? Yeah, you, you're going to get the same. Uh, so, so basically, I want it so, so the, the UK sales, if you throw that in there, it's going to have the same sign as our Brexit exposure measure. Yeah. Although Brexit exposure kind of picks up a lot more granular stuff. So I can even control for sales in the UK in these regressions and still get some action on the Brexit exposure variable. Um, of course, what you can do with like such traditional exposure measures is you can't split up between sentiment and risk. You, know, you can't look at like how much is coming from risk. And I showed you in the investment and employment regressions that all the action is actually on risk. Yeah, and this is true even if you have other controls for, uh, for Brexit sentiment, like you know the firm stock return and stuff like that. Other questions? No, that's all, thanks. All right, so let me kind of spend, I, how much, I have like 15 minutes to talk about the other paper or actually 10 minutes? Yes, 10 minutes. Okay, so now we're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna talk about coronavirus and SARS and other stuff, okay? So let me kind of kind of just skip the, so, so okay. So now like we're into the same thing, but now I have to add uh, another step, which is I need to look for keywords. So if I want to know what is the firm's exposure to coronavirus or SARS or H1N1, I need to look for keywords. It's not as easy as with Brexit. The way that we do that is uh, we identify the most common synonyms for each of these diseases using uh, basically what the WHO says, like how the WHO talks about this stuff. And then there's a, a computational linguistics tool that's called embedding vectors that you can train on conference calls. Um, to basically reduce false negatives. I can talk more about this if, if you're interested, but this is a little bit of like computational linguistics that we do here. And then uh, that's how we deal with false negatives. We do deal with false positives by basically doing human audit. So it's pretty easy in this Python script as you look for the keyword and then you have an RA, go and read the text snippets and see is this, is this uh, a, false, uh, a false positive. And then you find things like MERS yeah, sometimes refers to the Malaysian emergency response services. Yeah, but you know, with these medical terms, they're pretty unambiguous. So this is not a huge deal. In other applications, it might be more. So for example, after this, when we look for COVID-19, we land on, we're going to look for SARS-CoV, coronavirus, coronavirus, NCOV, and COVID. Okay. So now instead of having just one word, Brexit, I have a bag of uh, uh, words and I'm going to look for each disease. And now for each disease, COVID, 
SARS, H1N1, and so on, I'm going to construct disease exposure of firm I in quarter T to disease D. This is the same thing, but now I'm doing it for multiple different diseases. And the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to look how often is the disease mentioned divided by the length of the conference call transcript. And then in the same way, we're going to have disease sentiment and disease risk for each of the diseases. OK, so now let me show you COVID exposure by country and industry. So actually, first, let me show you here um, the percentage of conference, trans conference call transcripts that discuss each of these diseases, coronavirus, SARS, H1N1, and Ebola. And you see here the scale. So the percentage of firms that talk about COVID-19 is always zero until you get to 20, uh, uh, 2019 Q4, and then 2020 Q1, and it goes to 100%. Compare that to SARS, which maxed out like at 22%, H1N1, which maxed out, maxed out at 4%, Ebola at 3%, and so forth. So COVID is pretty... Uh, exceptional uh, uh, um, in the sense that all firms in the world essentially are talking about this. Here's the COVID exposure by region. Uh, what you see here is an early spike in China. China is this blue here. And then China levels off. And then you look at all the rest of the world. Yeah, the US is the gray. And they all go up together. So now take a mental snapshot of this. Pretty much everyone's going up together. Yeah, so... <clears throat> with the, the peak essentially being the last observation that we have in, uh, for April of 2020. We're updating this as we go along, by the way. Um, now compare this to SARS. Yeah, You see here the synchronization of coronavirus discussions is just remarkable. For SARS, you get spikes whenever SARS hits that part of the world. For coronavirus, it's just happening all at the same time. Compare it to H1N1 uh, and again, uh, uh, very kind of isolated spikes that are not synchronized. So in this sense, COVID is remarkable because it's going up in all countries at the same time. It's roughly also going up in all sectors at the same time. So this is now by sector. You have slightly little, fewer discussions in like uh, finance, insurance, and real estate companies, but everyone else is going up at the same time pretty much. Uh, again, this kind of very kind of... Um, uh, 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 a correlated uh, increase. So let me kind of show you here uh, some examples. So, uh, so these are the top five firms with the highest COVID exposure in the first quarter of 2020. Like this is January through March. And you see here Abercrombie and Fitch. I'm going to show you more about them in a second. Then you have, uh, oh God, I forgot this now. I think these are like, um, so this is a biomedical company that I think does something about tests for vaccines. Uh, then, and this is like a PPE company. Um, the firms that kind of first talked about uh, COVID early in January are like so or airlines. Yeah, and now you can sort of see airlines have some experience with this. If you look at like here's the here's the time series. Now I'm adding my disease exposure for all diseases up, and you're gonna it's for United Airlines it's gonna look like this. So, you know, they had problems with SARS because their airline routes got shut down with SARS. Then they had problems with H1N1 for the same reason. They were worried that, that some routes were going to get shut down. Uh, and then uh, if we're going to continue this, I have, it would go off the charts here uh, uh, in 2020 uh, with, of course, like all, basically all of United Airlines being shut down for a period of time. Compare this with Abercrombie and Fitch. They're pretty hard hit here because both they produce in China, so they were early on uh, exposed. Um, um, and, and because basically their, their, uh, their market is, uh, is imploding at the same time, you see like they usually don't talk about diseases. Yeah? Airlines do, clothing companies not so much. Um, okay, so now in the same way that we had uh, Brexit risk and Brexit sentiment, I can now have COVID risk and COVID sentiment. So let's look at that. So weekly average COVID risk here increases over time. And this is kind of, I thought this is kind of interesting that like we're pretty close to the peak of COVID risk at the moment. Yeah, so a lot of politicians seem to be talking about, oh, you know, like we're now kind of figuring it out and maybe like the support of things that can possibly happening is, is shrinking. Uh, but 
far from it. You know, firms are getting more and more worried about risks associated with COVID. Um, and COVID sentiment just trends down as well. So it's not like we bottomed out, bottomed out. So there's more and more negative vocabulary used in conjunction with mentions of the coronavirus. Now, let me run the same regression that I showed you for Brexit. Remember, we had like a, uh, a regression where I had the stock returns around the Brexit referendum on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, my exposure measures. We do exactly the same thing here. Uh, for simplicity, I'm going to put the stock returns in 2020 Q1 here on the left-hand side because we had like a period where like essentially coronavirus was spreading throughout the world uh, and people realized how serious it is. And you see here, just compare the magnitudes. Yeah, so this, uh, uh, so actually, so I think what this here means is that a one standard deviation increase in the firm's COVID exposure is associated with, associated with a 4% reduction in its market value just in the cross section. Remember that the, I don't have the constant here, but the constant is going to be something like minus 15. Yeah, so or minus 20. Everything goes down, but in the cross section, firms that are more exposed to COVID lose more. And now this I'm kind of very uh, proud of. Now. Now look at, let's look at COVID sentiment and split it up in positive and negative COVID sentiment. And you, and you might expect, you know, if you have negative COVID sentiment, I should get a negative sign on this regressor, and I do. And for the positive COVID sentiment, I should get a positive sign, and that's exactly what you see. For COVID risk, you also see a negative sign, and you put them all together and compare this to Brexit. In Brexit, all of the action was on the risk term, here we have some action on stock, the relationship between COVID risk and your firm's stock return. If you have more uh, exposure to COVID risk, your stock return goes down. But here we also have a very clear, a lot of action on the sentiment. So this is, so think of this as like a shock. So Brexit is sort of a shock that you talk about and you don't know what's gonna happen, but something to happen in the future. So it's all about risk. This is a shock that just hits you and you get shut down. Yeah. So. Yes, there's some risk. We don't know when we're going to be able to open up again, and we don't know if we're going to get our parts for our plane next month. But you're also just shut down, so it's bad. It's just pure bad, first, um, first moment impact. So I think this is kind of a nice pro uh, proof of concept here. We were playing around a little bit like early on, and this is kind of interesting like in sense of all, also how our thinking about this has evolved. Where we thought, like, you know, back in March when we first wrote this paper, or in February, we thought, oh, you know, if you have experience with SARS or H1N1, then maybe you're going to be better off with COVID. Maybe you've already kind of diversified your suppliers and done things to like reduce spread in your on your factory floor. And you actually saw some of this. So, so firms that had prior exposure to SARS or H1N1 had less negative COVID sentiment. Yeah, we don't have any outcome variables at this high frequency, so I'm just looking at how bad are the words that you use in conjunction with COVID, and I'm regressing that on how often did you talk about SARS and H1N1, and it turns out that you know firms that that had prior experience with SARS and H1N1 did think going into this that they were going to do better according to this measure, if you're willing to follow me th th that far. Uh, now, let me spend two minutes on maybe the most important thing. Uh, again, you know, remember for Brexit, I pulled out the relevant snip snippets and read them, and then I classified them. It's like, why are you saying good or bad things about Brexit? Now, let me do exactly the same thing for coronavirus. So if you, if you, now we can't pull them all because there's too many of them. Sorry, I should say one more thing. Just so you get an idea of how important this is. Um, remember this graph here? I should have mentioned this. These numbers here mean something. So what this here means is that the average transcript, the average transcript, they, they mentioned coronavirus like 14 times. The average transcript mentions competition or competitor or any word that relates to your competitor three times. Yeah, 14 times on coronavirus. On average, you, you mention your competitors three, to, three times. So this gives you some idea of like how coronavirus is crowding out everything at the moment. Um, okay, sorry, I, I, sh I should have mentioned that earlier. Okay, so now because of that, because there's so much talk about coronavirus, I can't read all the snippets, but I can randomly sample snippets and tell you what they're worried about. About half the mentions of COVID 
talk about the negative, a negative demand shock uh, for their business. About a quarter talk about supply chain disruption. Another quarter talk about production capacity reduction and closures. 20% uh, talk about employee welfare. And then 14% on average talk about financial concerns. And here are like some examples of, of such mentions and I have time to go through them I, now. Eric, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think we're at time. Uh, so to do um, more okay. of this wrap up. Two more slides. Okay. For positive mentions, so sometimes they say positive things again, as with uh, Brexit, when you say positive things about a bad thing, it means probably that you're not exposed. Yeah, so 11% of positive mentions have no impact. 13% uh, do talk about market opportunities, uh, and these are mainly sort of medical companies uh, that see uh, business uh, uh, prospects. Okay, I know we're out of time. Just take 15 seconds to look at this. This is not a great table, but it's very important, I think. Here we're tracking over time how the concerns evolve. So negative demand shock, yeah, so was important throughout and is still important. Stuff about supply chains peaked in February and then leveled off. Stuff about closures increases through April. Uh, concerns about your labor force increase over time. And then the thing that worries me the most is this year. So more and more mentions about coronavirus talk about, talk about finances and financing frictions. Yeah. So if you read this here, you want to say coronavirus is a supply shock. These two things, these three things. A demand shock, that first line, and is now turning also into a financial shock. Okay, so I guess I don't need to summarize this. If you're interested in doing research on either Brexit or coronavirus, uh, we have a website on firmlevelrisk.com. All of our measures are up there. These are firm quarter level measures, and lots of people have found them useful in their own research. You might find them useful too, so check out the website if you're interested. Okay, thanks very much. And sorry for going over my time. No worries, Tarek. Thank you very much. So we'll open for more questions. If you have questions um, in the audience, please send them on Q&A or simply raise your hand and we can get you, uh, get to you in order. So we'll start with the first question um, by Caroline Pfluger. Um, she's asking if you are concerned about reverse causality. For example, firms that have perform badly during Brexit might discuss Brexit in press releases to rationalize their stock performance ex post. Yeah, we were very worried about that. Uh, I didn't talk about that very much, but um, sort of one way of getting a feel for that is here, this is kind of my preferred estimate, 0.64. Now, if, if executives kind of now systematically mention Brexit risk as an excuse for bad for performance, then you might then you would expect this coefficient to go down or to get go closer to zero once I control for other measures of how well your business is doing. Remember, I already have like this non-Brexit sentiment in here, but you might not trust that. So let me control for the earnings surprise measured in the usual way. So how much worse are your earnings than usual? Or your firm stock return, you see that, you know, remember the standard estimate here was minus 0.6. You don't see this kind of fluctuating too much. If this was a major problem, you would expect this to attenuate towards zero dramatically. So that's why I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. But you're exactly right. There might be some cheap talk. My general uh, experience with these conference call transcripts is remember, like, so you can't really lie in these venues, right? So if you lie, you get taken to court. You can spin, but generally, I think we see all these associations with outcomes in the way that we predicted. So my sense is that there is actually informa actual information in what people say. Now, if you if we were in, in, if this was a Minnesota macro seminar, you'd say, well, all talk is cheap talk. Okay, I don't believe that. I I, I think that like you know if executives take you know part of their precious time to say, talk about a topic, that you know some of the time at least they mean what they say. And this evidence is consistent with that. Thanks. Next, we have a question from Ricardo Rice. Uh, Ricardo, we're now going to unmute you. So please feel free to ask your questions. OK, great. Hi, Tarek. Um, uh, question. I didn't understand quite on the COVID part, on the regressions. I mean, when we look at literally the COVID, it's a you show that it affects all sectors, all countries roughly at the same time. 
it's hard for me to think that in May, any conference called analyst isn't talking about COVID nonstop. So I couldn't quite see what the variation is there. And so uh, are your aggression is being driven by the previous, like the H1N1 and stuff, or is really COVID driving anything? And if so, can you explain a little bit more about what is this variation? Where is it coming from? So I switched on you a little bit. The first, and, and I apologize for that. So first of all, our measures are intensive margin measures. So if you say COVID 15 times, I think it's more important for you than when you say it just once. So uh, you're right at the extensive, and then I confused you because I showed you this picture here, which is at the extensive margin. Here I'm just counting, are you talking about COVID in the transcript, yes or no? And you're right, it hits 100% in 2020. There's, I think, no other topic in the world that I can think of that is not required by regulation that you talk about where you would get this. So this is remarkable. The variation in our uh, regressions is coming from the intensive margin in that sense. So you're right. Yeah, so, so all of this year is variation at the intensive margin. Though once you get past the COVID exposure, I'm sure not, you know, so by construction, not all firms are gonna have negative or negative COVID sentiment. So like, so things get a little bit more complex over here. But this first coefficient is certainly about the intensive margin. Okay, Tarek, I have a question for you. So um, in, have you thought about whether you can sort of um, shed some light on where these loadings on, on um, for example, Brexit risk, what explains these different loadings for different firms, for example, by thinking about the network of suppliers? Um, and, and because it, it, it seems like that would be particularly powerful if you could sort of um, try and uh, help us understand where these loadings come from. So um, my personal impression, actually, so we have, we have some regressions on this. Um, or actually, sorry, where is it? So the closest thing that we do is this regression here. So in firm level data, as you know, we actually have usually very little information about what is your exposure to different countries. <clears throat> so one thing that we can do is we can look, where's your operational headquarters? Where do you have subsidiaries? This uses Orbis data merged in. Uh, this here's segment data about where in the world are you selling? Uh, you can also do uses the segment data in creative ways, but you, you, you see here, you get an R squared of about 12%. So I think that reflects two things. Uh, one is that our firm level exposure measures are just bad. Yeah, so these, so, so, so this kind of stuff here. So the subsidiaries and sales and so forth, this is not, uh, so there's pretty sparse data and we don't know a lot about it. Uh, the other thing is that, the, and this is sort of the, um, the impressions I get from, um, from reading the transcripts is that just interdependencies across borders are incredibly complicated. And they're not as straightforward as if you have a subsidiary in the UK, you're exposed to the UK. Um, so, uh, so, and then there's this beautiful examples uh, uh, of this. Maybe the best one is like from another application that I didn't show you, but we have like in the paper, an application to, Fuku to the Fukushima earthquake. And we looked at which, which firms around the world have high exposure to the Fukushima earthquake. And then, you know, what you see is that like French firms are super worried about the Fukushima earthquake. And the reason is that French firms are the ones that make the parts that go into nuclear reactors all over the world. So they don't have a subsidiary in Japan necessarily, but it's just, this event tells you this industry is gonna go down the toilet. And now we have like the parts makers in France and we have reinsurance companies based in Bermuda that for some reason wrote contracts on, on uh, um, nuclear power plants on the other side of the world. So the mayor, more I look at this, the more I think that like simple input output stuff here is not really going to do the, 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 the trick. Uh, it's, it's very firm. I guess the point is it's very firm specific. Yeah. Thanks. I have a question. Um, so when you read the transcript, have you tried to differentiate between the case where the analyst asks the question with this term, like Fukushima, versus where the management brings this up? 
Uh, so the answer is we have, so in our, we have a previous paper on this where we measure firm level political risk. And in that paper, we did a lot of work splitting each transcript into halves. Once you've split them into halves, it's very easy to do this stuff. And the answer is, so, so okay. So, so for the other paper, we did it and we found there was information content in both parts. Uh, meaning you can run the regression just with the management part or just with the Q&A part and get the same sign and roughly the same results. Um, we haven't done this for this paper, for these papers, because it's just an enormous amount of work and it's very hard to make sure that you get it right. And the reason is that, so, so what's really problematic in these text-based things is, is, is just operating on the text if the transcripts, remember this is like, uh, so, I guess the transcripts start in 2002, go through 2020. These are hundreds of thousands of transcripts. And if they're not formatted all in exactly the same way, then splitting the transcript is a non-trivial task. This is a very mundane and like kind of silly problem, but it's really with the man hours that we have available, really hard to resolve. So the answer is in another project it doesn't matter and I'm too lazy to do it for these projects. All right, thanks. Um, I think I see no more questions on Q&A. So I want to thank you for having this terrific uh, seminar. If you have any other questions, please feel free to send to the ways of the authors. OK, thanks so much. This has been great. Uh, I hope we can all meet in person soon again.